Okay, let's talk about implementation. If you if you want your survey respected, you must bug your respondents until they realize you really care about them. So you get a survey in the mail, you get an email surveys all the time, an email, and they want you to fill it out. You know, I just, I'm like, I don't know, I suppose I'm typical, maybe I'm not, but I don't fill them out. I just click, and then a little bit later I'll get another one, and a little bit later I'll get another one from the same person. And if it's from one of my professional associations, and they're saying they really need to know this to improve their services, I actually go out and fill out the stupid thing. And it's like, okay, I give. I believe you. And uh, I'm pretty hard on uh, surveyors. So if they convince me, then they've done a pretty good job. But it's because they're persistent. You need to be persistent. Here's an example. This was done, a single mode snail mail lifestyle survey hospital employees. 988 hospital employees, 101 questions, 74.3% response rate. I had three mailings. There was no heads up intro mailing. It just went out. And um, I gave, um, if we can see here, let's see. I sent out the mail. These are days. I sent out the mail survey. I got a, a pretty good response, 25%. And going down the cumulative, oh, no, 25%. Oh, these are number percents over here. Sorry. Um, by this point right here, day six, I would have gotten a few more, but basically I'm at 20%. And so then I sent out a postcard. I said, hey, uh, if you responded to my survey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Otherwise, please do it now. <clears throat> there were a few more words. I think I might have a copy in the in the uh, file folder of examples. <coughs> Excuse me. I sent out a postcard, and it it peaked, and then started trailing off. Then I hit them with another complete survey. The survey consisted of a cover letter, the survey, no compensation, a uh, self-addressed stamped envelope, and boosted up again. Notice the peaks of these are all very similar for each mailing. And then it trailed off until I finally cut it off at 74%. So you kind of time your surveys, you, you you send it out, you give them a not too far in the future reminder, and then after they've had plenty of time, you reply. And you only, you only send out the mailing to the people that haven't responded. Now for the postcard, I believe I only send it out to people who had not responded, <clears throat> but, or whose mail letters I hadn't received. But generally you can send the postcard out to everybody and you just tell them if you've done it, thanks. And if you haven't, do it now. Um, the do it now reminds me that uh, it is generally advised not to put a date. Please return this by. That's for a couple reasons. One, you want them to do it now. You want them to do it while it's um, and since mostly now we're on the email, you want them to do it before it goes down your email stack to where it's forgotten. The other thing is, if you say do buy and you make it by the end of the week, then why are you sending them a reminder in two weeks? So you, you don't want to give a cutoff because you want to bug them until they answer. So you don't want to limit yourself on on how soon they have to reply. 
So don't say a do by. Just say, you know, here's a survey. We'd really appreciate your answer. And then when they get the reminder, they're saying, oh, okay, I guess he wants me to do this now. So you stick that in there. Nowadays, it's much more popular to do mixed mode implementations. Email with a web link, snail mail paper when you're desperate at the end. You can also start with snail mail, post a letter with a token incentive. It's hard to send a dollar over an email. The hassle for setting all that up is just not worth it. It's also hard for the person that gets the email, if it's a gift certificate or something, to cash it in. So send out a letter, the token, let the person know that an email is coming that's going to have a link to the survey. You can even put a link to your survey in your written letter if you want to. But mostly the purpose of this postal letter is to let you know something's coming. We're in survey mode. <clears throat> I'm going to change this from seven days to three days later. Oh, no, I know I did. I did seven days because I want to make sure they got the letter. So it takes a couple days to get a letter. So seven days later, you email, you have your intro cover letter and a link to the survey. Three days after that, you send an email reminder. Thank them if they responded. And if not, Respond now. It's important that you know who has responded and target only non-responders. Even though they've already filled out your, your survey, you still don't want to annoy the people that have completed it. So you do want to end, well, with an email, it doesn't cost you anything, but um, you only want to target the people who haven't responded. Okay, now you give them some time, but not till the end of the world. 14 days later, follow up with another email. Now, if you don't hear from them by then, one thing you can do that will help you is to send a full survey mailing with a self-addressed stamped envelope. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I mean, again, you want to make it easy for them. Don't send them another dollar, although uh, Dillman actually says sometimes you can offer a later incentive. That seems to me to be counterproductive. I mean, if I knew somebody, was, if, I, if I was getting the second survey from this person, I know that they pay if I procrastinate. <laughs> I would never fill it out, waiting to just collect the cash. But... Um, you want to give them a, a full survey mailing and uh, I'll just say one thing about the stamped self-addressed stamped envelope. You can use a machine stamp for your mail out when you have the envelope that takes everything. And by the way, business envelopes come in different sizes. You can a normal, you know, very rectangular business envelope um, is in two sizes. The smaller size, you can get a slightly, just slightly smaller size that can be your self-addressed stamp envelope that they, you can fold up the survey and return it. It's also nice to make the survey in the form of a little booklet with a nice picture on the, there, there's a There's a definite methodology that uh, is used in creating the, the booklet that I'm not going to get into because you're mostly going to be doing internet mailings. But I'm telling you, this last one will kick up your response rate enough that it's really worth doing. But check out Dillman or some other book uh, on how to actually uh, do the, the booklet. I mean, this... This was so detailed, and I just think it's such an effective thing. And one of the things that I did, um, Dillman suggested that 
you on the in, inside mailer, well, you can machine stamp the outside, put a real stamp on the inside. Research has shown, uh, you report some, a study where uh, a real stamp boosts your uh, response rate over a machine stamped self-addressed envelope. I will tell you when I did this study of the mothers, the, the post office sells stamps where you pay a little bit more for a charity. So I got um, stamps that were women's health and women's health stamps and they cost me more but uh, I don't know if they made any difference over just a regular stamp or not but I just felt that the person would potentially see that that I cared about women's health and that I paid a little more they may or may not know that I paid more for that but they'd see that I at least am, am giving a stamp related to their survey and and might give just a little bit of an extra kick to completing it you really want your response rate up you want to get your coverage as much as possible reduce that error and so that's one of the things that I did and then finally if you still haven't heard from them after a week send them another postcard if they haven't thrown it away it's around there <laughs> I remember on the postcards uh, I would put down um, um, if you happen to lose your survey let me know and I'll send you another one and honestly on that lifestyle survey with the that I had shown in this study I had um, I had I believe seven people requested the survey and three people actually said their dog ate it so <laughs> it was uh, that was kind of interesting okay I want to talk about confidentiality confidential and anonymous confidential means you know but you are not telling anonymous means you do not know who responded and you cannot follow up I recommend strongly not to do anonymous surveys um, do not be fooled thinking people will only answer questions if their responses are anonymous. They're going to remain anonymous by not responding. Um, you will get a much better response rate if you follow up specifically on non-responders. You will do better if they know you know they didn't respond and so you do not want to do anonymous surveys there are I, I really honestly can't think of any situation where you would want to do an anonymous survey but confidential means that you're you are going to know but since you don't know them and they don't know you who cares if you know you're not going to tell other people you're going to tell them that you keep a separate mailing list uh, and their identification is not linked to the data analysis. So there again is that trust. They have to believe you, but you will gain more people by them knowing you know if they've answered than by saying their responses are anonymous. Okay, cover letters. And I've kind of got one oriented to email, one oriented to paper, but um, on an email cover, you, you want to, you want to personalize the email as much as possible. Now, I mean, basically everybody knows you're filling in stuff with a computer, and it's not like you are personally typing this out and asking them. Uh, but it's still good to use their last name. 
should avoid sending emails with multiple recipients in the two. Now there's probably software that allows you to do this, um, but uh, you want to um, you want to just have their name in the two. For one thing, if you have all the others, then you're kind of violating the confidentiality thing where their other people are seeing their name up there. You don't want the prompts to be the same each time. You're not just resubmitting the same email. You're changing uh, the tone and emphasis of what's being said each time. You should send emails early in the day, 6 or 7 a.m. People read their email first. They may be the kind of person that will, will kind of go off on a tangent and answer the survey to get it out of the way and go on. Sending emails around noon, they generally just fall down the, the stack. So you get, when, when the person checks their email, all these other emails have piled up so much, as they go down the list, they just start deleting and not paying attention. So you do better if, if your email can be seen early in the morning, first thing in the morning. Get to work, look at your emails. If you send it around six or seven, it's going to be near the top. So that's the best time to do it. Emails should be short. The purpose should be stated clearly in the subject line that it's a survey, that it's what its purpose is. You have to keep it short so that it doesn't cut it off. So it's really important to be, um, be efficient here. In the body, you want to tell how that person was chosen and why they are important. It's important to let them know why they are important. Otherwise, they're just another person and you can get their answers from somebody else. You want to tell them that their responses are confidential, but you do not collect their email addresses, sell them, or or whatever. You're going to assign a unique ID for follow-up only, or you're going to tell them that you've used their email address for follow-up only. And you're going to give instructions for completing the survey, uh, which includes the URL or an access code. Subsequent emails focus more on why it's important to respond. And the final mailing says the survey time frame is ending. And uh, you would really appreciate them getting in because you've only sampled a few people and you need to get as representative of a sample as you can. So um, in order to answer this important question in a fair and balanced way. The from line should not be from johnhayes at gmail.com. It should be from johnhayes at pacificuniversity.edu or intel.com or some reputable sponsor. And the name on the from, John Hayes, should match the name of the person and organization in the body. Thank you. Sincerely, John Hayes, Pacific University. Um, you want to avoid spam. You do that by sending out individual emails. I know that can be sort of a pain, but it is well worth the time to send each email out separately. you got to type in the number anyway. Well, don't necessarily, but you want to avoid CCs and BCCs. Those are cues for spam filters. And you want to use plain text rather than HTML. Um, HTML can be coded in some spam folders. Get rid of that. Cover letter for papers, basically the same. It can be a little longer. You can get into it a little bit more. You personalize it on real letterhead on quality paper and use names if you have them. If you don't have the names, use the location. Dear Forest Grove resident. Not dear resident. 
The advantage of a cover letter, the first mailing, is that, uh, and it's paper, is you can send a token of appreciation. Again, promising a lottery. Don't even waste your time. Doesn't help. Costs you money. Not worth it. Okay. So reserve your surveys for important document for important topics that are linked to specific decisions. Design your survey to control the sources of error, sampling, coverage, measurement, non-response. Enumerate. Get a list of the people and then randomly sample from that list. Treat your respondent with respect. Give your incentives before on your first mailing. Don't promise anything after they've done it. Kiss your questions. Balance busy, visually. Show no mercy in your pursuit of a response. I thought I'd just add this little note when you're writing your results section. Be sure to describe your population, the response rate that you get. Provide a table with each question and response percentages, even if you do take the means. You can put that in the appendix. Summarize your data with graphics whenever you can, although I'm not really a big fan of bar charts with percentages for each question. That seems to be kind of a waste. It's more... Um, comparison type of graphs. Think data density. If your data only, if you have a scale from one to five and you give the percentage for each response, agree, um, slightly agree, no preference, slightly disagree, strongly disagree, you have five data points. And some of them are redundant because if you strongly agree, you don't disagree. So um, that's not a data dense figure. You know, try to have at least 10 or more points on your graphs. You can create scales from similar items using factor analysis, assuming your data can be averaged. And test hypotheses if appropriate. That means that you have looked at a probability sample and not a non-probability sample. So again, good questions and answers that are traded with social capital results in successful surveys. Select a representative cohort and go after it with gusto.